A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. You and I both know the line. We probably have sung it a thousand times. It's a great line and a great song. It's a really good line to sing. It's a whole nother emotion to actually live out that line, a thrill of hope. See, until you've been in a dark, bleak, seemingly impossible situation, And then all of a sudden, there happens to be a chance that it could be better, could be different, it could change. There is a possibility that it may not end up so bad, then you don't really understand a thrill of hope until you have experienced it. But once you've experienced it, then all of a sudden, that line is not just a line of that song, it is an emotion, it's an experience that you've lived out, a thrill of hope. About five weeks ago, I was in a situation that seemed impossible, a situation that I found myself in, seemed impossible until something happened and I experienced a little bit of hope that it could be different. See, about five weeks ago, I was in my truck with Mola's son, Daniel. I was taking him to his basketball practice. He's fifth grader. I'm the fifth grade basketball coach for his team. We're driving to practice and my cell phone rings. Now, I don't know about you, but I get a lot of sales calls to my cell phone. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know, they just call all the time. I looked at this number. This number is from New York City. I thought, ah, sales call, ignore. About a minute or two later, New York City, same number, ignore. A few minutes later, same number. And Daniel goes, hey, Dad, why don't you just answer, see who it is. So I answer it. I go, hello. And the lady on the other line, she goes, hey there, how's it going? I said, ma'am, I don't know who you are, so I'm going to hang up now. Take care. And I hang up. <laughs> now, don't, don't judge. Are you not up here? <laughs> I want to ask you how you respond to sales calls. Right, so I, I hang up and we're driving. Same number calls back again. Ignore it. Calls back again. Ignore it. Calls back the sixth time. Dan goes, Dad, why don't you just, just answer it and just see what they want? So I picked up. I go, hello. The lady on the line, she goes, hey, Chris, how's it going? I said, who is this? And she says, this is so-and-so's mom. You're his basketball coach. Merry Christmas. I didn't, I was like, hey, you know, you got the wrong number. I didn't, I didn't couldn't say that. I was like, oh, hey, what can I help you with? She goes, I just want to make sure practice was on tonight. And I was like, yeah, I'll see you in 30 minutes. And I hang up. Daniel goes, dad. I was like, I thought it was a sales call. I felt so bad. And I called Brianna. And I said, babe, I'm an idiot. And I explained my situation to her. And she did not disagree. <laughs> I get to the practice and Dan goes, dad. I was like, I know. I was like, it is impossible that this situation will ever, you know, go well. I just assume she's going to show up, pull her kid off the team because it's a jerk coach. I don't blame her. I would do the same thing. We show up. The kid is there. I run practice for about an hour or so. Practice is over. And now comes this moment where I need to address the situation with this lady, but I'm just going, this is, you know, not going to go well. And so let me just go ahead and get this over. So I walk up to her. I go, hi there. My name is Chris and I'm an idiot. Seemed like the best way to start that conversation. And she looks at me and I was like, ma'am, I'm so sorry. And I apologized profusely to her. And I, I did not tell her what I did for a living at that moment. <laughs> it did not, did not seem like the appropriate time. Anyway, I go going to apologize and I stop and she smiles and she says, don't worry about it. I understand. We just moved here six months ago. Still my old cell phone number. And she extended the most gracious, kind, warm words, most forgiving words. And there in that moment, I went from it's impossible that this relationship will ever be salvaged to men. Th- there is hope that, that it could be better, could be different. Fast forward to last week. Last week, we finished practice. And, and I went up to her. And this time, I, I told her what I did for a living. And she seemed surprised. <laughs> she did. She did. Told her what I did for a living. She goes, oh. And I, and I said, you know, I invited her to Christmas Eve services. I said, I'm going to share this story. And she goes, oh, I'll be there. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> but there in that moment, what seemed dark, bleak, impossible to overcome, man, there is a glimmer of hope. And the problem is when you find yourself in an impossible situation, It's impossible that I'll ever get married. It's impossible that I'll ever land that job. It's impossible that uh, I'll ever get out of debt. It's impossible that I'll ever have kids. It's impossible with fill in the blank in your life. The problem with 
impossible is that it implies that there is no hope. I mean, the very definition of impossible means it's not possible, like it cannot change. But oh, my friends, you can experience the thrill of hope when you move from the impossible to go, this could be different, this could be better, this could change. Even if it's just a small glimmer of hope, there is a thrill to be had when you experience hope in a dark situation. And that very first Christmas, Mary, the mother of Jesus, for her, hope took on a whole new meaning that very first Christmas. Because you see, that very first Christmas, she experienced the impossible. What anybody in the world would, would, would claim that is impossible, she walked through and she experienced that the impossible really could happen. If you've got a Bible, grab it. Let's look at her story in Luke chapter 1. If not, it'll be up on the screens. Luke chapter 1, this Story unfolds leading up and, and to this Christmas story. Luke chapter 1, verse 28 it says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Good news, Mary. You found favor with God. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be a king. His kingdom's not going to end. Mary goes, hey, uh, quick question. Has to do with biology. Just, you know, uh, just a couple of things. And look at what her question is. Verse 34. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Hey, hey, I get it. That's cool and everything. But, you know, Gabriel, I'm not sure if you're familiar with biology here on earth. So, you know, um, I, this is really impossible. I mean, I like what you're saying and all, but, but I'm a virgin. What you are saying, it's really impossible that that could ever happen. And Gabriel goes on to explain how it could in the following verses. Verse 35 it says, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he'll be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but now she's in her sixth month. And verse 37 is what ties it all together. He said, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. And the angel left her. Hey, Mary, you found favor with God. You're going to have a son. Hey, a quick question. How is this going to happen? Don't worry about it because nothing is impossible with God. So let me just go down this road of logic for a second that if nothing is impossible, then that would mean anything and everything has hope. Like, if nothing is impossible, if we're taking impossible off the table, then that means any situation that you find yourself in has hope with God. And what I want you to grasp this Christmas is just simply that idea is that with God, there is hope in every situation. There is hope with whatever dark situation you're walking through, unemployment, bankruptcy, infertility, cancer, loneliness, divorce, Failure, you just down and out. Whatever you are walking through that seems impossible, I'm just here to tell you that the good news of Christmas is that hope was born. And Mary, all she says was like, listen, everything that you said about me, let it come true. Fast forward nine months, and everything that was said about her did come true. Everything that was said about her did come true. The impossible really did happen. And on that very first Christmas, I just go back and think about that scene unfolding there in that moment after the shepherds have come and gone and, and, and it's all settled down and she's there holding, you know, Jesus in her arms. I imagine this and I imagine Joseph, he's probably in the corner sound asleep. I mean, he just, he's like, man, I am worn out. And Mary just goes, seriously? So um, that's my own commentary. But anyway, he's over there in the corner. And just, I imagine, you know, that very first Christmas there... 
and she's looking at her newborn son, Jesus, and there in that moment, on that very first Christmas, Mary is literally holding the hope of the world in her arms. It's not just another baby, not just another newborn, it's Emmanuel, God with us, the son of God in her arms, God with flesh there in her arms. And there in that moment, you would just have to think that hope took on a whole new meaning, that you'd have to go back nine months and in the conversation with the angel, and then he goes, with God, nothing is impossible. And there in that moment, she realizes that's the truth. And that if nothing is impossible, then everything has hope because with God, there is hope in every situation. And there in that moment, she's holding the hope of the world in her arms. Fast forward from that moment 33 years later. She's there near her son again, but this time in a little different scenario. This time, instead of holding her son in her arms, she now sees her son beaten and bloody and hanging on a cross. If you're a mother here in this room, you can certainly put yourself in that situation. At the hope of the world, she now saw what hope had to do. That hope had to live, that hope had to die, that hope would be buried, that hope would come back to life. But there, in that moment, hope had to take on a whole new meaning. The writer John, in John chapter 1, verse 4, says his life, and he's talking about Jesus. He says his life brought light to everyone. He's a light in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And there in that moment, in a very dark place on the cross, is the light of the world. Hanging there, bloody and beaten, he dies, he's buried, darkness thinks it's overcome. Three days later, Jesus comes back from the grave, and the darkness can never extinguish that light. And I don't think that there is a better metaphor for hope than light in a dark world. I don't think there is a better metaphor when you think about darkness and you think about light because even a little bit of light brings a whole lot of hope in a dark world. And this Christmas, if you're walking through a dark world, if your world is dark, I'm just here to tell you that you can find hope in the light of Jesus. If your marriage is dark, if your finances are dark, if you're walking through the darkness of infertility, the darkness of loneliness, the darkness of divorce, the darkness of failure in general, you're walking through that dark moment, it just seems impossible to overcome. It could never be different. It's bleak, it's dark, it, it cannot change. I'm just here to tell you that if you want light in your dark world, it can be found in one place and it's in the life and the light of Jesus. Jesus is that light of the world. My question is, is he the light of your world or you continue to walk through a dark place? Because nothing brings hope like light in the darkness. And I experienced this per- firsthand two weeks ago. I found myself in the dark and saw some literal light that brought more hope than you can imagine to my life. You see, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Guatemala. I was over there with Compassion International great organization, seeing some of their, their projects and things. And it was the last night, and we had to get up about 3 a.m. the next morning to get on the shuttle to go to the airport to, to come back here to the United States. So I go to bed about 10 p.m. that night, and we're there in a hotel room. And our hotel, the doors opened up to a courtyard. They weren't interior doors. They opened up to an exterior to the courtyard. And I'm there, sound asleep about 10 o'clock. About 10.15, all of a sudden, I hear gunshots outside my front door. Ba, 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 ba. It's that moment where I was you know, just about to sleep and I wake up going, did I just hear what I thought? I thought, oh, maybe I didn't. Lay there for another second or so. Ba, 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 ba. And all of a sudden, you, you, I go from sound asleep to my heart is about to beat out of my chest. Gunshots are going off. I don't know what to do. The only thing I can think is to roll off the bed and hide underneath the bed. And I'm there on the side, and pop, pop, a gunshots are going off. Now, you just need to know, I'm a cheapskate, so I was too cheap to buy the international plan for my cell phone. So, you know, I, Brianna knows that I love her. I'll meet her in heaven is what I'm thinking. So <laughs> I'm going, you know, I didn't know what to do. And, and also gu- gunshots, pop, 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 pop. And there's a back door to this hotel room. I begin to army crawl back there. And I get there, because I, I know there's a fire escape going down. I open up the door, and I get on the balcony. I'm about to go to the, down the fire escape. And there, that moment... I look up as the night sky is being lit up by fireworks. (laughs) So 
<laughs> so I, I wish I made that story up. I really do. Like, there's that moment where I, I was crawling through and all of a sudden I was so glad to, to, to see those fireworks. A lot of things went through my mind at that moment. Stupidity, number one. After I got over that, there was that moment where all of a sudden I realized my life isn't being threatened or over. Now all of a sudden it's very, very different. And then the, the next morning we're, we're going to the airport and the, some of the people I was with are like, hey, did you hear those fireworks last night? And I was like, yeah, fireworks. That's what I thought they were. And anyway, there's that moment where you go from crawling to all of a sudden that there's light. Now, some of you, you've been army crawling through 2018 and you're dodging the proverbial bullets of life, relationships, finances, work, uncertainty, family drama, addiction, whatever it is. And the bullets are flying and you're crawling and you're crawling from 2018. You're just hoping to make it to 2019. You did the same thing in 2017, 2016. And I'm just here to tell you, you want 2019 to be different. You want to experience that thrill of hope. It is by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, who is the light and life of the world. But I think all too often we army crawl through life we come to Christmas celebrations like this and we go, oh, that's nice. We check, check it off the box and we continue on and we wonder why things didn't change. And if you're a Christian here in this room, you know, Christmas is not just this cool tradition. It's not just a, let's make sure all of our emotions feel good. It is a reminder of where our hope is placed and that it's placed in Emmanuel, God with us is what we celebrate that the little baby that was born 2,000 years ago that wasn't just another baby, but it was the hope of the world. And if you're not a Christian and you're here today or you're watching online, my guess is you're here probably to keep the family peace. I mean, I get that and I appreciate that. And you would probably never come clean with me or maybe any of your family members, but it's really easy to put on the happy Christmas face. It's just what you do. Put on the happy Christmas face, you wear your red and green, you go to church, you light a candle, you go eat dinner and you just just hoping to get to the, to the next year. But if you're honest, not with me, but if you're honest with yourself, my guess is there are certain areas of your life that are dark, bleak, or seem impossible to overcome. And you, you sat in a church like this last year and then the year before, and nothing has changed because you just go through the motions. And so a simple question I have for you when it comes to placing your faith and your, your trust in Jesus for your hope, my simple question for you is, what do you have to lose? Like, in my opinion, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Because isn't the very definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results? And so you can sit in here with your arms crossed, looking at your watch, waiting for the service to be over and roll into 2019 and going, why did anything change? Or you can say, you know, for far too long, I've been army crawling through life and today I'm ready to place my faith and my trust in Jesus where my hope can be found, where my dark world can have light and you can walk out of this room experiencing that thrill of hope. 2,000 years ago, the hope of the world was born. The impossible really did happen. And I'm just here to tell you that with God in your life, there is hope in every situation, no matter how dark and how bleak your life may seem. Jesus, his life brought light to the world and the darkness will never extinguish it. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and if you are a Christian here in this room, and I would just take a moment, take a deep breath, and maybe reset, because I get it, it's super easy to go through the motions of Christmas to fight traffic and to go do all that stuff, but man, just to recalibrate and go, Christmas is a reminder of where my hope is placed. And if you're here in this room, and you're not a Christian, man, I hope for you that Christmas, like you learn the truth of where your hope can be found. And that I get that your world seems dark and bleak and whatever thing you're walking through seems impossible to overcome. But just from the bottom of my heart, if you would trust in Jesus, place your faith in him, I promise you, you will have hope through whatever situation you're walking through. If you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never experienced that hope, that peace, forgiveness for your sins, and knowing that when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven, 
If you've never experienced that, you can just say something like this and mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I place my faith in you for my salvation. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Give me a newfound joy, peace, and hope. Help me to follow you all the rest of my days. Thank you for my salvation. Now, with every head bowed and every eye still closed, I just want to ask you a favor. If you pray that prayer for the very first time, would you do me a favor and just kind of raise your hand up in the air just so I can know, just so I can see. If you pray that prayer for the very first time, see hands there. And if you would do me a favor, just tell the person that brought you, say, I prayed that prayer. Put it on the card in front of you and drop it off in the box. But I'm telling you, that is the absolute greatest decision you will ever make. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for coming to earth. Thank you for being the light of the world and our hope in a very dark place. Jesus, go before us. We ask these things in your name. Amen.